This is Steve Blame with Pop the History Makers. <laughs> Taking you back to 1981 with Junior. <laughs> Junior's had a fascinating life. He was the first British singer to be on Soul Train since David Bowie. And James Brown is holding your hand and saying to you, hey man, you know, you kids are coming in and trying to take my spot. And Michael Jackson was a fan. Michael would like to meet you. <laughs> oh, wow. And stole something from him. He said he stole some moves from me. Junior, wouldn't you like to do something like that? Junior suffered from racist attitudes at the time. And for him personally, there was terrible loss. His wife and daughter both died from multiple sclerosis. I kept making music and kept listening to music. Lifeblood, lifeblood. But despite the successes, the trials and the loss, Junior's interview is really about the power of music to heal. It kept me motivated, it kept me alive, it kept me still thinking about being able to make another record, being able to say something fast. Junior Giscombe, this is an uh, immense pleasure because if anyone's written and performed um, a track that really was well, I think I'm the same age as you, so this is a bit weird, but, but was really part of my early 20s and something that I absolutely adored. Um, it's you. So uh, it's great to meet you. Um, I want to take you back to your childhood because lots of stuff comes from the childhood, obviously. Um, and I just want to ask you what your family life um, was like. I had a happy childhood, really happy childhood. Um, one of eight the youngest. Um, my brothers and sisters were all born in Jamaica, so I was meeting them going along, growing up. So my parents would send for them and they'd come over. And it was an incredible kind of scenario. I'm born in England. They were all born in Jamaica. So by the time I was three, I had a sister who was 12 who came over to look after me as such so my mum could work. But all during that time of my brothers coming over and everything else, my brothers were close with a lot of people in sound systems and bands and, you know, that kind of thing. And the house that we lived in, the, the second floor of the property had a, a big open square. And my brothers, their bands, my mum my, my and dad were so cool. The bands used to come in and they used to practice upstairs. So me and my sisters would sit on the stair and watch. And my two older brothers then had their own group together, which were called the Four Crowns. And uh, they got a deal with Jetstar. During this period of time, three of us were living in the same room. So when they were rehearsing with the rest of the guys in the band, I was watching them using the, you know, the old time, the old to reels and stuff like this to put their vocals together and stuff. So, and listening, also listening to a lot of the music that they were buying and listening to as well. My mum and dad, my dad was a jazz my mum was into gospel, my brothers were into soul music, my sisters were into jazz as well and uh, pop music. So I had this whole eclectic thing going on and because in those days you would rent rooms, we had a Scottish couple who lived upstairs and they used to come down and they would play a lot of Scottish music as well, and bagpipe stuff, and all that kind of thing. And so I was engulfed in music as a child growing up. But it wasn't until really I I went to church with an aunt and I watched these people just get off on singing and just letting off. And it just took me on a high. And I never forgot it. It just... I want to do that. I want to be able to do something like that and touch people in that kind of way. You're a kid and you just, you, that's how you're thinking. I couldn't have been more than around about six or seven at that time. But um, I wanted to do something. I knew I wasn't going to do a normal thing. I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do something that was a nine to five job. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something that was, I realized that I was more creative than I was into the educational part of things and stuff. So I, I, I pretty much was gauging myself when I was very young in what I liked and what I didn't like and where I was going and people I was moving with. I pretty much 
had that all down. My mum and dad, my dad was a carpenter. My mum used to do piecework back in the day, you know, where you work from home. She was a presser. And um, because she had the children and they both had to go out to work, my mum decided one day, I came in from school and I said to her that why was, no, when she came in from work, I said, why was it that everybody else that I knew at school, right, their parents or their mum was at home and you would always be out of work. So my mum changed her job, bless her, and um, changed it to piecework so that she could work at home so that I would come home and she would be there, you know, that was the kind of woman she was and uh, that kind of way of being. In such a large um, family, yeah. there's often a sort of competitive uh, atmosphere. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> was it I like think, that? <laughs> no, I think, uh, to be honest, I think my two um, elder brothers have, were very competitive, right, against one another. Um, I didn't get myself involved in that. So <laughs> mine was my, my in terms of competing, I had, a, she passed a few years ago, but my sister up from me, she was the most creative person that I had known up until that time. She uh, could draw and she had such an imaginative mind. And when she was, I think it, she was eight or nine and was asked to go to, was asked to come to a, I think it was one of the art schools, one of the top art schools in, in London, saw her work. I don't know how this all happened, but came around and asked my mum if she would like to have her daughter go to this school. And my sister said, no, she didn't want to go. She loved the school that she was going to and stuff. But in terms of art, Dawn was the one, you know, I, I used to admire how she could do things. You know, she'd have me and my other sisters sit down there and she'd tell us a story and it's off the back of her head and it would just all flow. And we would all be coming back tomorrow, tomorrow evening. We want to hear the next part of it. And she'd have it all down and, and just, she was amazing, Dawn, in what she she was truly the creative one in the family out of all of us, but she never, she never pursued it. Whereas with me, it was more, I got what I was about. So, you know what, I'm not competing with you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a really, you know, it's a cohesive family and a supportive family, yet, in the outside community, and I know this as a gay man in the 70s mm. and 80s, um, it wasn't great to be gay. It certainly wasn't great to be black. <laughs> um, so I just want to know how that made you feel being in this wider community where uh, black people were often not accepted. The way that people were viewed because of their color, because of their sexuality, it was amazing to me as a child growing up. You know, you go into the shop and, you know, it'd be like, you know, how are you doing? And, and, and you're like, what? You know, and <laughs> this is somebody in the shop who's going to serve you, right? So you were already, you knew from you were young, right, that the world that you was living in wasn't shaped to 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 have you be inclusive as they want to say nowadays so you kind of knew where you stood so instead of uh, just simple things instead of let's say following england in a cricket match we'd all go to the west indies but we were all born here right but we want the west indies to win against england it was our way of getting back even though we couldn't get then you get to the scenario of the, the riots in London and you are looking at young men who are in exactly the same position as a lot of them are today. We're looking at no real prospects, no real, how can I move myself from A to B? What can I do to do that? 
most aren't in the position to be able to do that. And at that time, it was going on, especially in South London, it was very, very heavy. You know, the way the police handled the kids, us look during that period of time was very, very heavy. You know, we had the curfew in earlier times as well in London, South London, and all that kind of stuff. So you you were being brought up in in a scenario whereby you're not really liked, right, from one perspective, and you start to then look at your history and you start to say, oh, right. So the victors always are the ones who determine who and how history is. And you go deeper than that. My mother was a Marcus Garveyite. So my mom would tell us about ourselves and we could read about ourselves. And that gave me the strength to not look at people in a derogatory way because of the way that I was being treated. It was like more that like, I understood that it was more about the people who were running the country than it was about the people who lived in the country. So the scenarios that the people who live in the country were being given, right? It's a bit like COVID today, you know, we, we've been given so much rubbish and then you find out exactly where they were coming from at that particular time. Well, it was the same thing. You, you, you understand that it's not the man on the street. He's just following. It's the guy at the top who's determined. And we sussed that early when we used to do, when I used to go out and do, um, rock against racism gigs, right? And it would be gay, lesbian, everybody. I, I don't, so I didn't get it. And then I go out and I do the Red Wedge tour and I get to Liverpool and it's supposed to be a unifying scenario and some guy's shouting out, you black, this, that, and I'm Tara. And I stop the show and everybody's saying, Junior, calm down. And you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on. You know, you're not getting that, are you? It's supposed to be an inclusive show. We're supposed to be as one. Here's an idiot who wants to show up, right? And you're telling me I should calm down. That's exactly the same thing that a teacher would say to me if he was being derogatory to me or, you know, uh, just calm down, calm down. You're, you're getting too excited when you're, you're trying to bust out and say, listen, mate, right? You're not getting it. This is an everyday occurrence for me. So, of course, I'm bubbling up. Right? If you were listening to me, then it wouldn't be an everyday occurrence. You know, so that's what was happening in that, like, 70s. Clubs were great. The whole interaction, we were, we were multicultural before they even had the word multicultural. We were all going to the same places. We were all doing the same kinds of things, the same dances and moves and into the clothes and the whole bit. You know, there wasn't... As much as like punk was happening, the punks were into reggae. So do you get what I'm trying to say? So there was always this crossover. There was always the melting pot. There was always a cohesive togetherness that we, the people, right, would have worked on and could have made better in a shorter space of time than having people who have never been in the environments that we've been in turn around and determine how we should see one another. So it was... I wanted to, when I decided, I'd say around about 15, 16, like I had a choice between football and music and music came easier. And I pretty much had a better understanding then of, of what you want to try and do. Everybody's doing jazz, funk, everybody's following the American. I don't want to follow the American. I want to do something that's distinctively us, English, Right, that has a sound that's us, but competes, that people will feel a different kind of energy from. But I didn't know how to do that then. I was too young. I, I knew that's what I wanted to try and do, and make music last. But obviously you don't know, and you're getting yourself into something whereby your, 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 your energy to succeed drives you. One thing you're saying there, and it sounds like, and this is why I'm asking this question, because it sounds like a very confident thing to say at 15 to make that choice and to know what you want to do, but not know how to get there. But you've also talked a lot about 
confidence being a big issue in your life. So were you a confident child? And I just wondered if you weren't, where did that lack of confidence come from? It was more about being shy. When I got confident is when I realised within myself that I could do this. And I knew that uh, what it, whatever it was, I could do it. I could, I could do that and do it well and do it in a way that wasn't like anybody else's, but obviously your, your, your influences coming from what's around you, obviously. But how can I try and make this a little bit different, make it more from my mindset than the mindsets of others that I'm hearing? And that started, the confidence started to happen when I put a band together called Atlantis. This was must have been about 78, it's college. And, and uh, we did a show at London School of Fashion. And all the songs that we were doing were songs that I'd written and got the band to play. And we played this gig and it was packed. I don't know how people knew, and it was packed. And every track was something that nobody had ever heard. But the audience participation, once they understood what the chorus was to the songs, just blew us away. And at the time, I had a George Anderson, who went on to play the Shack Attack. He was a bass player. Um, Paul Gendler, who went on to play for Modern Romance, was the guitarist. We had some players, but we were just kids and it was fun. And that's when it started in terms of that inner confidence that you could do it. And then you'd go and do solo little, in those days, it was just little things you go up and sing. Nowadays, it could, you know, PAs and whatever. And I'd go up and I'd know that I could do this, I'm going to win this. And I'd win. So it wasn't like I'd win and I'm like, eh. I knew I'd win. I didn't do it not to win. If I'm not going to win, then I'm not going to play. Right? It makes no sense. I played to win. And that was what it was. I wanted to win. I wanted to do something that would make people say, wow, wow. And I was very fortunate, as I said, I did. What's interesting about what you say there about performing on stage in that band and that the audience... Uh, singing along with the choruses, which means that they drew a connection, that they recognised yeah. something within themselves, within what you'd written. What had you <laughs> written that connected to them? And was that the point, that this connection is where you really understood your power and that's what gives confidence? Yeah. I think you just <laughs> you summed it up in a nutshell, yeah. I, I got I got there. I... I I wasn't singing about me. I was singing about us. And that's what I wanted to put across, right? And it came, they got it. It was about us. It was about what was going on with us, right? And how we can keep positive. Because at that time, a lot of music that we were hearing was from Jamaica, it would be culture music. So, you know, people just, point to Bob Marley, but, you know, we are talking about the Abyssinians, we're talking about Fred Lux, we're talking about all of these different reggae artists who were about at that time, who were talking about their environment, the life, the aspirations, the journey, you know, those who went before, not to forget. So we were, in that time, from a reggae perspective, we were getting history on top of history for us to go out and read and understand. And then we would go and you would get the pop thing. So you'd be listening to the Stones, the Beatles, and those kinds of songs and who they appealed to and why they appealed to them. And I got it, I understood that like it didn't make sense just to write a song for a song's sake. You want to write a song that touches people. You want to be able to talk to them. You may never meet them, but we can speak because they'll feel you. 
So when you go on stage and you're in front of them, right, they're feeling, they get it. They understand what that junior thing is all about. You mentioned that you like to win and you entered um, singing competitions, let's call them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, one with the uh, uh, Isley Brothers track, For the Love of You. Yeah. Um, when you talk about connecting to an audience, connecting to an audience when you've written something yourself, I mm-hmm. presume is a slightly different thing than actually singing someone else's song and being able to connect to an audience through that song. So what is the difference for you? I think, I don't, I think what it is, is how you, the, how you, the artist, interpret the cover that you're doing. So it's like you can do a cover and it's not done it's not done in a way that says my name is Junior. It's done in a way where you're saying I'm covering Stevie Wonder. So there's not you there. You're just covering a song. What I've been trying to do over the years is if I do cover songs, and I do, I try to make them Junior. So there is a sound within your own voice that you understand. There is a way that you sing your songs which are completely different. There is a way that you tell the story that is junior. And I've, I've taken those songs and made them, the change is going to come. You know, I love singing that song. You know, um, Stevie Wonder's uh, Love's In Need Of Love. I love singing that song. And at the same time, I still love doing what used to say. And I still love doing Too Late. You know, I still love being able to catch you with songs. Back at that time, you're 19, um, and there are two parallel things happening at the same time. There's Mm -hmm. uh, the move to a record label and to to having your own career, and at the same time to being in Lynx. Can you tell me about those sort of parallel things that were happening and what came first? (laughs) Well... Lynx came first to be, well, no, no, come on now. Junior came first and then Lynx yes. came afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> right. I had signed, I had signed as Junior to Mercury Records and we put out, um, Mama used to say, and it nosedived, didn't get played, got slated, the whole story. Anyway, at that time, Lynx had, David and Sketch had, decided that they wanted to go on tour. We all were working out of the same office in Marlborough. And <laughs> David came up and just knocked at the door and I was in working with Bob Carter, who was the producer for it. And uh, came in and said, Junior, we're going to go on tour. We want you to join the band. So I was like, uh, you, uh, I'm on my own. you know, you kind of like let me think about this a minute, you know. So Bob then turned and said, "No, man, just join the band. Let's do this." And I thought it'd be a laugh. That'd be great. At the same time, we put Mama out July twenty eighth, eighty one, and it died. That track is such an instant. You, I mean, particularly at that time, it was like an instant, unique, positive. Sound. I mean, I remember being in clubs and it was like, look, it's the track. This is such a cliche for an old man to say, but it's the, the track where you ran onto the dance floor. You know oh, what really? I mean? It was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was that track. And um, yeah. so I just wondered that when you created something like that and then you're, you've got all these hopes because it's your first single yeah. for, for Junior and it right. comes out and it flops. How does that make you feel? Dreadful. <laughs> I remember going home. <laughs> I remember, I remember when it came out. I think we one, it was like something like a hundred and something, and I couldn't believe it. And I remember turning to my mom and I said to my mom that like um the records died, mommy, and it's not it's not gonna, gonna happen. And I'm just hoping that they give me a chance to do another one. Right? I'll make it even better. So my mom turned and my mom said, why do you think that it's finished? So I said, well, it didn't get in the chart and stuff. And she said, yeah, but the title, Junior, Mama, that's going to go to Spanish-speaking people. It's had, I hadn't thought that far. 
hadn't even, didn't even touch anywhere in my brain at that time. But after she said it, I was like, who knows? Come on, who knows, Jim, right? You did what you wanted to do. You did it, you, you, you're happy with what you did, right? And you got the chance to do it on a major label, the whole kit and caboodle. All right, it didn't work. If I get another chance, right, we'll come again and we'll try and make it better. And that was my mindset. So when I went out on the road with Lynx, four months later, five months later, and we're, we're this band and these people are going crazy. It was, I had no idea that this was going to be the prelude for whatever was to come for myself. So being a part of that was like, wow, is this what it is? In terms of being able to tour and, and play to people. We were doing two, 3,000 people a night in, in a, around the country. We did seven, um, two shows a day at the uh, Dominion in London. We were like the biggest band in the country at that time. So it was an, an amazing scenario to go from your record nosedives to your ending up the year being like in a part of like the biggest band in, in the country. You know, bigger than Duran, bigger than this, and bigger. So that was amazing. That six month period between it died, well, four or five months nose diving and then being able to be a part of something like that was just amazing. And then during that last week of the tour, just before Christmas, I started to get phone calls from the record company that mommy used to say had been taken off in America. And it was on most of the American radio stations, black radio stations. And then just after Christmas, Figures were coming in, 100,000 cells in New York in a day, you know, 100,000 cells in Chicago. These numbers were doing my head in, you know, because I'm living in London. I don't know anybody. 100,000 records just out of London alone. I, I couldn't believe it. And, and that's what it was every day. 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, a million. Then it went on and then it went on and then it went on. So you're going from this Lynx thing into your own thing. You're now going to go to America and be on Soul Train and be the first black artist from the UK to be on Soul Train. And your, your, your journey is now taken on a journey of one of it being history. So it was becoming wild. You know, you're, on, you're getting presented with an award from James Brown. And James Brown is holding your hand and saying to you that like, hey man, you know, you kids are coming in and trying to take my spot. And I'm like, mate, I guess what? I got the first tune on King Record, right, of you. Money can't change you. I've still got it. A little 45, my sister sent me from America. And you're telling me about me taking your spot. You're crazy. But it was that I I had I'd arrived. You know, I'd actually arrived. My peers who I'd been buying their records was now asking me about how I made mine, which again, it can freak me out. Yeah, you I'll know. come to that in a minute. I know where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come to that in a minute. But just to go back to Lynx, because that yeah. period of touring with a band that had massive hits like Intuition and You're Lying, great, mm -hmm. great tracks. Yeah. You're a backing singer in that band. Mm -hmm. um, David Grant is the lead singer, right. what did you learn for your later life as a performer by being in that band? What do you think you gleaned from them? And do you think they gleaned anything from you? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I was very quiet within links. I've watched a lot and I, the sound on stage was something like, beforehand I hadn't really taken much notice about being on stage and your sound on stage and stuff like this. I think from from the keyboard player from Bob I learned a lot in terms of production and sound right from JJ the guitarist how to entertain from David how to entertain how to be energetic on stage fun on stage and Get yourself across. Um, sketch, 
mood, very moody, right? So he was the guy you could go to and you get yourself into this mood. And he was so cool, lovely people. I think what I learned the most was, was that like this whole success thing that was happening to us at that time, you knew was fickle, not because of the music that was being made, but the industry that you were in. And remember, we still had that whole mindset of how you perceived black people and how you perceived their success and how you were going to transmit, excuse me, how you were going to transmit that success over and over again to a white audience that they wanted to manipulate your look to ensure it worked for them, opposed to dealing with who you were. So we were still there. So you could see that after, I think it was the second album, after the second album, you could see that the whole thing wasn't going to stay together in the way that you joined it because it now had to start doing things that it didn't want to do. And I could see that. And that made me understand, like, one, to own your own stuff, two, to be fully aware of what you're in as instead of it just being the creative side of things, understand it's a business and understand that you're not dealing with creatives when you go a bit higher, you're dealing with businessmen, right? So it was that whole journey, again, with links was brilliant. You know, as I said, from a creative technical side, I learned a hell of a lot from each individual who was there. As I said, with David and with JJ, the two, them especially, in terms of how to hype crowd up, how to get them going, right, how to mellow them back down, how to get them singing with you. It was, it was an education watching the two of them, right? So that was great. And as I said, from a technical standpoint, Bob was brilliant in, in being able to show me what that side was all about. I just want to take you back to Mama used to say, and can you remember actually when you wrote it and how easy that process was and how clear you were writing that knowing and believing in it i had i was working in a shoe shop in moon and this young lady walked in and she looked gorgeous so started talking and stuff and i asked her her age and she said she was 18 and i was 22 and i thought jesus if i tell her that she might think i'm too old so I told her that, can you imagine? So I told her that I was 20. <laughs> so, she, so I got the date. So when I went at home, I, I was talking to my mum and I was telling her about the fact that this girl came in and that she said she was 18. And I told her that I was 20. And my mum said, well, I, you're 22. I said, yeah, but you see, I told her I was 22, right? She's going to be thinking like maybe I'm too old. My mum cracked up laughing and came back and she said to me, I keep telling you, right? You're rushing to get old. You took to take your time, Junior. I keep telling you, like, look, no, you, you're dropping your age. And I had the whole story right there. She gave me the whole story. So I went back to work the following day and I wrote that song in around about 15 minutes. It wasn't, it was one of the quickest songs I'd ever written. It was that easy because it was, it was about what you know your mum sell you. It's about, you know, listening to them and understanding that they're the guiding force within your life on this earth. Well, if you're lucky enough to have that kind of mother and I was, right? And, you know, one who I could talk to, one who I didn't feel that I couldn't express myself, I couldn't say things around. You know, sometimes you, your parents, you don't want to say this, you don't want to say that. My dad, yes, but with my mum, I could say anything and I could, I could tell her anything. And it was just so easy to... to, to if you like, write on behalf something that maybe she would have told every child that came into her room. You know, during that period of time, I was always rushing. You know, where you going? Where you going? Where you going? <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I've got to find something. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to some museum. I'm not going to Carnaby Street. I'm not going to. I wanted to be out. I wanted to be part of this world. And the only way to do that 
was to be out there. You could, you know, again, just touching on it, stay with, with yourself at being a gay man. Now, during that period of time, the way that we were supposed to perceive being gay, right, and the things that people would say to gay people, and you would stand there with them, can't say that, man. Yeah, but he's this. No, but you can't say that, man. It's not right. You get what I'm saying? That's where I was coming from. I'm, I'm not seeing the world through this these these other people's eyes. I'm seeing that, like, you know, everybody's a human being. I don't understand the rest of it. I just know that we're all human beings. I know that we come from one source. I realize that, and I realize that we are all completely different as human beings. Can I ask you, the, the girl that came into the shoe heel shop um, yeah. where you were working, was that the girl that became your childhood sweetheart that became your wife over many, No, many years? unfortunately. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I wanted it to be the most romantic story I'd ever heard. See, that's where I come from. <laughs> no, <laughs> it could have been. It could have been. It could have been. <laughs> I've got the date. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we won't go down that avenue now. Then, um, the the song Mama used to say, as you said, it was picked up in America. It was picked up by a DJ in, um, from Paradise Garage, as I understand. Yes, right. The um, the whole thing was that there was a. Radio station called WBLS in New York, which is like the number one radio station at that time. And its number one DJ was a guy called Frankie Crocker. Now, unbeknown to me, Frankie Crocker, if, if Frankie Crocker plays your record, the rest of the country just plays your record. Frankie was that guy. So he had a show where he was doing, he had a DJ and the DJ would do mixes for him. And the DJ was called T. Scott. And T would do these mixes and play them down at the Paradise Garage. And then, if it worked, he would then come and play it on the show. Well, that one play just blew up. And it was Frankie Crocker that really started the ball rolling in America. Just once he played it, I went on his show a few months later and that just blew the record up. It was like, you would drive around in America at that time and, and you would hear 12 minutes of mummy used to say, because they would play the English version and the American version back to back, which was just amazing for me to hear. Because you, you've been told from your doing it the English way that it's not good enough, it's not this, it's not that. And then you, you, you do one of the first remixes because in those days, a remix was exactly that. It, you didn't add, you took what was there and you remixed it, you replaced it, rejigged it, and whatever you do when you remix. And uh, it worked for England because it was a more, what I would call a deadpan American sound. So things were more deader. So the sound would be more harder, especially the drums, and the, because the drums is a rock drums. It's not an R&B drum and that also, makes it special. Pattern isn't a straight R&B thing. It's more rock and roll thing, right? So going back, and that to me was also one of the things about it that like I think loads of people got. It was the shift. It wasn't straight ahead R&B kind of vibe and hi-hats. It, it was a drummer playing a track that in his mind was a rock and roll track. Da -da 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 that was Andy, you know, one of the best. But that's what we were after. So to to hear the two sounds back to back used to blow my mind. I used to love it. <laughs> but by the time I came back to England, I didn't want to hear that record anymore. <laughs> You mentioned earlier that there was someone, you know, by the name of Michael Jackson, <laughs> yeah. who uh, asked to meet you because you'd, I think you'd been on the same stage or you'd been at something, you know, at some gig together, as it were. And he asked to meet you. What did he, what did he say to you? I was doing this, um, Kim Wilde and I 
were on were up to do this tour, the bad tour. So we were the opening act. So we had come to Wembley, I think it was, and I got a knock on the door, and it was one of his aides, and he asked me to, you know, Michael would like to meet you. So I went, wow. So I went back and uh, I met him, and he was so lovely. I didn't, I was, I've been a Michael Jackson fan, but, you know, you're a kid growing up and you're watching Michael Jackson. You know? So this is, this is the ultimate performer. That guy does it. And I didn't really know what to say. So I, just, I turned and I said to him, um, he said to me that his sister Janet had told him um, about me. And he watched a video of uh, Mama used to say, and he said he stole some moves from me, right? So I said, what? And he said, I'm like, this guy is crazy. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is Michael Jackson. He's telling you that he stole moves from you and he's showing you, you know, which ones and he's flicking your foot. I just, you know, you, you, right, okay. And then I must have asked him about bubbles. Yes, I did. And I asked him, what was that like, right? Being able to, go there and, and put your monkey in front of like thousands of people and this is the person you're going to speak to, you know. He said, Junior, wouldn't you like to do something like that? <laughs> did you? I wish I did. <laughs> oh, dear. What I, I love wouldn't have bought a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I love about Michael Jackson is exactly what you said. I mean, okay, the word stealing, I think, is in in essence the sort of wrong word, but he definitely took ideas from the history of the great dancers and incorporated them in his stage show, often duplicating moves, not, not changing them massively, just duplicating them, just du but putting them in a new context. Yeah, but that was the beauty of watching him, was that whole thing of if you if you understand the history just like you do. You, you're looking at him standing at the side of the stage watching a Jackie Wilson. Watching, do you get what I'm saying? He's watching the greats before him, you know, the James Browns, the greats before, he's there watching them. Every night, you know, going out on the road with them and being able to watch and being able to steal the moves and do it in a younger way. And that was what was the beauty of him for me. You know, it wasn't, that like, oh my, he was a genius and he was a this and he was a that. It was that he took his surroundings and brought it into him and then just, whoosh, this is how it's going to work. So my that. question to you then is, who did you listen to? The tonal quality, the phrasing, you know, the type of, the type of song, the emotion in the, shot, the song, which were the ones that you listened to and for want of a better word, took pieces from, as it were, yeah. and took them yeah. into your music, because we all are influenced by things. Right across the board, I think, at, at, right across the board, from the writings of the Beatles, the energy of the Stones, to the, the magic of Stevie Wonder with his vocal tone and, and how different he was as a sound during that period of time, and how he sung the songs that he sung that made him sound so different. I love that. Marvin Gaye, the melancholy, I love the way the phrasing, I love the way that Marvin could make you just, you're lost in a world by the way that his, he would tell his story. Um, Aretha Franklin, any time. Mahalia Jackson, any time. Chaka Khan, I, to, all of these people, their phrasing, but it was all about that individual sound that they all had. None of them sounded like the other one. And that was what I always was looking for within music, that like the people who sound themselves. Nobody, you, you, you can, there are millions of imitators of the Stevie Wonder voice, but you know Stevie Wonder. Do you get what I'm saying? He is that. And, a Luther Vandross, let's say, right? You're going all the way back. You can go back to you know, Dusty Springfield for me, right? In the way that she sang her song, right? So it wasn't just one person, right? That I would listen to all the time. It would be a load of them because it was like, they had something special 
you know, if I wanted to listen to, my mum was a big Ella Fitzgerald fan, mighty. So that TikTok kind of jumpy kind of vibe that she does when she's singing and the way that she holds it down. And so I went and saw her with, with, with my mum. I took my mum the present. She didn't know me. She came to the jazz cafe and, and um, she was, at that time, she had an advert out where she was singing a top C and it would break the glass. And um, <laughs> I, I thought, you know, okay, let's go and see this one. Not my kind of thing, I hear it, but, you know. And I just became a fan that night. Me and my mum were coming home talking about her and, and, you know, the gig and how fabulous her voice was. That was it for me. I was into voices and how they play with melodies and the hold up and the diction and the timing. Those were things that each one did differently. Barbara Streisand was another one, did it differently, you know, right? And, and it was that that would capture me all the time, you know, but I used to listen to a lot of them, um, R&B records and everybody's riffing. And I'd be like, just hit the notes so that I know what the song is, opposed to riffing over the notes so you're not really hitting any notes. But it sounds good. Hey, and I understand that. But it's not me. I can't do that and don't want to do that. Right? Because then you're, you're becoming a part of uh, a section of, of, of music that you don't want to be a part of. You want to be a part of it, but with your voice, with your sound. Going further than that, in terms of like the, you mentioned Marvin Gaye, and of course there are social and political messages in Marvin Gaye's uh, mm -hmm. music. People like Curtis Mayfield had, you know, very deep political um, messages. Were those the people that also influenced you? Because you mentioned the, the song Too Late, and I know it came from a specific story and such a mm -hmm. powerful message, but I just wondered, first of all, were, were there a group of musicians that really influence you to understand that music can have a is a powerful force? Those same guys that you just turned around and mentioned, you know, the Lost Poets was another lot as well, right? Yeah, very much so. Because it was you, I was understanding that, like, in Britain it was, give me a love song, give me a happy little love song. And you know you're you're black and and we want to see you smile and we want to see you dancing and you know it was all of that rubbish and um, I was never good with that. <laughs> Can I just stop you there because the mindset about gay people for me was always they're fat and funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it just? Yeah. Wasn't it, was like, it just? What the fuck? Really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you get me playing. Oh, uh, hell no. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> so let me just read the lyrics, part of the lyrics to Too Late, because I just think this is this, this is amazing for a song text, really. When he comes home intoxicated from the club, all the kids, they go and snuggle up to mum. He starts shouting again, and they start running again. This ain't, ain't no life for them to lead. Where did that song actually come from? That was being on tour with Michael McDonald in Edinburgh. And I had met a young lady, it was at the Edinburgh Festival, and I'm walking around and I met this young lady who was a punk. And we just hit it off, saw one another, started chatting to one another. I didn't, don't know Edinburgh. So she started taking me around the festival. We sat down and we started to talk. And she was asking me, you know, my background, where I came from in London and what my family was like and that kind of stuff. So I was talking about that. And I asked her the same question. And she told me her story, which was basically that her mother had been abused, um, that she had found life really difficult. But remember, we're, I'm 26. She must have been about 24, 23. But... Up until that point we, where we were talking, her life was the pits because of what took place, what she saw and couldn't get over and, and school life was crap. She had some a younger brother and a younger sister. And all three of them were totally, excuse my language, but because of that scenario. 
I came back down to London and was in my bedroom, had my Juno 6 and, my, you know, my little box. And I put the radio on, and the first song that came on was Rick Jane, Give It To Me, Baby. But it starts with the lyric, when I came home last night, I was so intoxicated. And the word intoxicated was it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. That whole story was like you, I could picture it then, just out of intoxicated, I could picture it then. I could picture the whole fact of some guy coming in drunk, right, you know, and just abusing the mother and the children don't know what to do and they're, they're in their own little corners and how that must have felt. And when I did that song, I had to fight the record company for it to come out. They wouldn't, didn't want to put it out. They still wanted, they didn't fully, because Mama was such a huge success and they wanted to continue down, down that kind of road. Mama was a social song. It talked to everybody. It was about everybody. And that was Mama. Too late for me was like, here is Junior. This is what I'm about. I listened to your Curtis. I listened to Gil Scott. I listened to the Lost Poet. I know what time it is. And if I'm going to speak, it has to be about collecting. And you've got to show something that you know is happening, but nobody, could, again, 1982, three, who was talking about abuse then? Who wanted to know about that? Even if it was being spoken about, it wasn't being taken on board. So I fully grasped the record company's hesitancy in terms of putting the record out. But when you start to dig deeper and you started to realise it wasn't about the record junior, it was about you and it was about your colour and it was about you saying something like that. And you're going to not get the backing that you got for the first one and you're not going to get because they're not going to want to be behind us. So I knew that, but I still fought for too late and I'm glad I did. So you have the beauty of the song that touches you from the music and you have the pain, which is sometimes within the lyrics. What is, about, what is about the connection of those two things in one that have such an impact on us? Good question. I think because we are, as people, so diverse. So we, we, we have empathy. We, 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 we can feel. We can understand. We can, some people will turn and say, I love the beat of Too Late, and it took me five years before I actually understood what the song was about. Oh, my God. And you're like, but that's it, isn't it? You want them to grab hold of that bittersweet. You want them to rub. You want them to be able to feel it as well as maybe not express it, in, but you can feel it. That's what I've always been after. It's, it's making you... But at the same time, it's kicking in here. So you see when you can't do this, that lyric and that song stays here. Most of us can't dance in the way that we used to dance, but we remember those lyrics and might even stand up in a corner and sing along to them. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? And you know, it's that that doesn't that's 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 my joy, that's my excitement, that's that that's the key. You mentioned um, the record company and the record company being uh, anti that release. Mm -hmm. A lot of the choices that you've made have been choices based on what's inside you to actually do what you want to do and not be conventional and make the choices you wanted to make. I mean, after mm -hmm. that, you work with Phil Linnet, which isn't yeah. the immediate <laughs> thing that you go oh yeah junior feel it goes perfectly together it's like <laughs> two different genres somehow making you know something very special but yeah. also being something that i imagine the record company just flipped out about and it couldn't hang at all when we finished um first first track we did was a lady just loves to dance i still love that song and uh we did the song and the management presented it and the comments back were like, you know, he's from rock and he's from 
pop soul. Nobody's going to go for this, right? You know, and plus he's a black guy. And that was what killed me and Phil when we came back. And they said, plus he's a black guy. And Phil said, so which one of us? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> they just oh, woke no. up. <laughs> <laughs> Christ. It was brilliant. <laughs> that's how it was. We could I mean, see. mentioning that track, I listened to it today. And um, what I love about it is you can hear both of you separately. Do you know what I mean? I can hear yeah. Phil Lynott in that track. I can hear yeah. Finn Lizzie in that track. And I can hear you exactly. in that track. And interestingly enough, um, wasn't it Tony Visconti that had already <laughs> produced and worked on on that track? Who obviously worked with Bowie. That's probably the, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the biggest name that he'd worked with in his his career. And yeah. um, it was a track that really, with those combinations, you know, Tony Visconti, you, Finn, uh, Phil Lynott, you know, Thin Lizzy. It's like, how can you not release? Come on, these songs. So what? They, what they just didn't. They just didn't, we, we, I think we did about four or five songs together and they just weren't having it. They just weren't having it. That they would not take on board what we were doing. You know, they poo-pooed it all the way along. And in the end, it was a bit like, I think um, Phil had to go back out on the road or something. And I hadn't seen him for a while after that. You know, because we, at that time, it was like a concerted effort to get this project done. Do you know, we had John Sykes from White Snake on guitar and stuff. You know, we had a, a great array of musicians on this. And we'd go around by fields and we'd rehearse around there. Lemmy would be there as well. So it was amazing. But as I said, for me, it, it's always been about the music. As I said, my my environment from being a child was not about it being pop, rock, this, that, even though this is what I'm hearing. It was, I like that Take 5 track, Dad. I like, I like that Maelia Jackson track, Mum. Boy, that Wilson Pickett's really, do you get what I'm saying? I, I love that Beatles track. That's where I was coming. So going into being, Phil and I met up, Coco's, and Phil comes up and Phil says, Junior, I want to make a record with you. I want to do something different. So I'm like, what do you want to try and do? He said, I want to do something that's soulful, but I still want it to be within the, the Lizzie vibe. So I was more than up for that. Come on, let's go. Let's give it a try. Let's see what we're going to do. It, it, who knows? Right? Plus, for me as well, the other side of my mind is thinking, wow, when people see this, Junior and Pim Lizzie and, you know, Tony Visconti, so my head was already there, just like yours. Right? I could see this. Right? You know, that, that whole thing would have exploded. But just because of colour, they wouldn't put it out. And that was, as I said to you, when you, you start to understand what you're in, because it's like you would be going to a meeting, for instance, and they're talking about marketing your record, but they're telling you, after you've just done Mummy used to say you sold maybe 10, 12, 15 million albums and singles, and they're telling you that the most that they can spend is 25 grand on you because... ABC are coming out with their second album, right? Which they, the record company, are telling me they know isn't as good as mine, but the budget's 1.25. So you sit there and you can't actually believe that these people have the gall to be looking in your face and telling you that even though you sold more records than this band, they're getting 1.25 million to promote their record. And for your next album, up and you're getting 25 grand. So you start to fully grasp and you pull back because you start realizing that, like, no matter what you sell, um, or what, sorry, no matter what you sell and the quantities of what you sell, the backing from the record company to continue to make sure that that thing is rolling will never be there because you didn't start what Mummy used to say by them actually promoting the record. The record broke in America through a DJ. So the record company in America never spent money. So everybody's making this money, right, out of its record, but nobody wants to plug back in. Do it again, June. 
amazing. Yeah. The, um, as fans and consumers of music, from my perspective, okay, um, obviously someone like Phil Lynott, you know, had enormous fan base, had a lot of people that just loved his music. And when someone of that caliber dies, it has a big impact on the fans. For someone like you who worked closely with him, and I presume, you know, you considered him a friend and a confidant because you'd, you'd work so closely with him over quite a few years. How did his death impact you? And how, I don't know what the word is, how tragic is it that such creative minds have um, a tragic end and they have had often in the music business over the years? I think the pressure can get to you sometimes and, and addiction. But my love for Phil runs deep, very deep. His loss was a huge loss to me because I could talk to Phil away from everything. And it always end up with some Irish joke, right? That he'd have to tell me the meaning of and stuff. It would just crack up the up. And he he was wonderful for me. He really was. And he taught, I remember talking about writing songs with him. And he said to me, I said to him, how do you manage to do those songs where you're doing 100 miles an hour, right? And you're doing half time in there. How's that work? You know, you, you, your track's going there, and you're going there, going there, but your vocal is throwing the whole thing into another place. He said, half time, Junior, half time. So Junior went off and did a jungle record when jungle was happening. And that was like 150 odd beats or some madness like that at the time. But I went in and I'm like, how do you do? And I just remembered Phil. And it was like, oh my God. And everybody's like, yeah, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? Like, hey. <laughs> that was Phil. Phil gave me tips. Phil gave me good insight. Phil was like a brother, right? From another mother who we didn't have to speak all the time. We didn't, because when we did, right, it was on top. It's great. So his passing, for the fans, I know it must be great loss. And for those who, who like myself, loved him, an immense loss. You mentioned... <laughs> racism in the music industry and also racism in in society in general and one song that you did with Kim Wilde in a sense became a sort of stance and a symbol in a way as well for what racism was and how it could be perceived because when you look yeah. at the the video so tell me you'd already met Kim at this Michael yeah. Jackson thing some years before I think that was the yeah. the first time you'd met. How did the song come about, first of all? Kim rang. She rang me and said that she'd written a song first time she was going to write a song, her own song. And she said, if I'd be up for helping her and putting this whole project together. And I'm, I'm, I love Kim. I really do. She's a good friend and lovely person. And I said, yeah, 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 no problems. So I, I was, I think it's in France. I came back from France and I was, she had a studio, her and her brother, Ricky. And um, we went in and we did another step. And uh, again, I could see, I remember having this conversation with Kim and Kim said, I was so excited about the fact of the record being done. It sounded great. And it was my first song that I'd ever written. Right. And we were now going to go out and we'd, going on this promotional tour, we're going all around Europe, we're going to South America. And she was hyped on that. I weren't. I was hyped on the fact that, like, I want black and white shirts. So we do these grainy black and white shirts and big old posters would be up, right? And no, I want the Royal Albert all festival and stuff, right? Yeah. Right, and that's what's going in my head. That's what I want, and that's what I started to call for. And we were getting it. We went on one program, 
and I won't mention the actor's name, but he and I were round the back and we were talking and everything was fantastic. I thought he was a lovely guy. And then we go on stage and he introduces Kim Wilde and friend. Oh, Kim stands oh. there. Yeah. So Kim stands there and says, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. You know what's going on. I said, yeah, but we're doing it. No, we're not doing it. But, but we're supposed to be going on and they're waiting. And we're having this discussion. And I said, no, we're going to do it. Come on. She's like, no, no. I said, come on, let's do it. So we went out and we did it. And she gave that guy a bollocking afterwards, which that was down to her. For me, it was just, well, this is normal. Do you get what I'm saying? For me, this is normal. This isn't. And what, you know, we went out there, we blew him away, and that's what mattered. To hell with him, right? And that mindset. And that was with another step. So, again, showing you, we've gone into, what's that, 86? 86, 87, we've gone into that area, and that was still going on and you just kind of thought to yourself this is amazing isn't it that people haven't moved on the psyche hasn't changed the narrative is still there in abundance and blatant but nobody sees it you know but you're you're seeing it but as i said i don't do these things to lose and when we did another step right i knew what I was doing. I didn't want it. It wasn't about a hit record for me. It was still about showing the like, establishment that, like, we're here, you know. We're here. And we are affecting our society, right? And we're doing it in a positive way. And imagine we're doing it together because it was she and I. And I loved it. Everything was darkish in terms of the way that we wanted to portray it. She didn't get where I was coming from, but I knew exactly what I wanted. It wasn't a hit record. That I, I didn't need a hit record. I needed a statement. I needed a statement. And that that record, when I, I remember going down Charing Cross Road, and this big poster was up of me and Kim, right? Just the faces and the black and one that's really dark. And I thought, yes! <laughs> yes! You know, you are affecting. That brings me really nicely to another question, which is, you've had massive commercial success in your life. Nice. Um, what does success, because this relates to actually, you know, making a statement and things like that. What does success mean for you today? Is it the ability to be able to, to continue to make music, to continue to perform and to continue to be out there? Or is it... <laughs> a hunt for commercial success still? No. The latter's a definite <laughs> no. <laughs> Obviously, you know. <laughs> it's a definite no. Um, I think, I think, to be honest, success has nothing to do with the music business for me. Success for me was being able to go through a period of my life with my daughter um, that grew me as a human being, grew me as a man, grew me to be the person that I am today. So the success of records was great when you're a kid and that's what you're after. And you think that you're successful because you've sold a lot. I've seen many a band out there sell a lot. Nobody plays their record anymore. So my success really, if you want to say success, would be that the music that I make has been long lasting, has lasted and the test of time for me because it's still being played. It's still relevant to people's lives. It still paints a picture when heard. That's success. Right? I don't think success is the materialistic things that we have. And, oh, I've got a great house, I've got a great car. I can go here and I can go there. I think it's how you live with people, to be quite honest. I think if you can live with people genuinely, Right, which is sometimes very difficult, but if you can live with people genuinely, then that's a success, real success, not not the commercialized success of being on TV and winning an award and smiling and this is wonderful. That's all part of the game, and I get that. But most, for me, that period with Janique, when she was going through what she was going through, I think that's 
success, being able to come through that and still be driving. I still, you see, my whole thing, I love music. I, I, I still just love music. And that's producing it, writing it, singing it, making it. It's still, I still have that kid jump up in me. It's not gone from that period when I started to now. It wavers like most things do, right? But in essence, I think the success is just continuing to have that, wanting to still put things out that touch in different ways and understanding what you're trying to do. That's That, to me, is success. You know, I've never looked at the trinkets of the business as being something that you point to as showing that you're a successful person. I think that's really quite tacky, to be quite honest. <laughs> you know, I just think it is. I just think it's quite tacky. And, and I just think that, like, you know, if this is what you're given to do, you're given to be a journalist and that's all you've ever wanted to do and you can continue to do that for 40, 50 years of your life and still have a good intelligence, mindset and, and goal for it, then that's success. You know, you, you have to look at all the amount of people, especially from my era, but I remember the amount of different artists who came into the game had a one hit and you never hear of them again and... You go down to some supermarket and they're working in the supermarket and you, you know, they're telling you that they still want to come back into the business and stuff. And you feel for them because they've been out of it for 10, 15 years because they had to look after the kids or, you know, they had a mortgage or mum got ill or, and all of these things that maybe stopped them from being able to do what they love, right? And then when they want to do what they love, they're out of sync with the time that they're in. And yeah, you know that that you see that. So you you give so much thanks for the fact that you're still doing what you're doing. You know, it's not like <laughs> you know what I'm saying, whereas most of the people have had to go out and do a nine to five job. I've never done a nine to five job the past 24. You've had tragedy in your life you mentioned your daughter Janique um your wife also died of multiple sclerosis I think it was um and to experience this, these tragedies how important was music in keeping you going lifeblood lifeblood I I kept making music and kept listening to me during that time, it kept me motivated, it kept me alive, it kept me still thinking about being able to make another record, being able to say something fast. Lifeblood, so important to me. As I said to you, I'm, I'm a, music is my life, music is my life, music is me, music is what I'm about, music is, I love it, I just, I don't care where it's coming from, if it's good, I just love what it can do to your inner being you know it can touch you in ways that like you know nothing else can you know you can watch it you can see a picture and piece of art and it can it can hit you but you can feel a piece of music and your whole being changes and mindset can change and your even your personality for that split time that you're within that moment can change that's amazing to me absolutely amazing to be able to touch somebody without shaking their hand but you shake them it's amazing well junior i mean it's absolutely brilliant to to listen to you and i have to say thank you for making such a wonderful creative contribution thank to you. our world because i think that's a really important thing and i also think it's really important from my side to say thank you because you know that's undoubtedly you've touched me in my life through your music and i think that's a great thing i also want to thank you for your support of the gay community as i of course. In my community. <laughs> <laughs> so you are my brother junior <laughs> thank you very much it's been a pleasure thank you for having me steve up there is an interview i recommend down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews 
And here is where you can connect.